We're going to be seeing what we can tell you about propagating some of those plants that you have in your garden that aren't quite hardy or you're not sure if they're hardy yet is another uh, way. Um, here in North Carolina we can grow a lot of things. Uh, I know some of our viewers are not here in North Carolina and you might not be able to grow some of the things that we can grow um, in, in le except as a tender um, plant. So. Um, we're just gonna do some, some really basic things that you can do at home. Nothing complicated. We're doing small scale propagating, not commercial propagating. So these are nothing difficult. And uh, I'll just give you some uh, tips and uh, I'll show you some of the things that I like to propagate. Uh, and actually some things that my volunteers have asked me about recently too. So we're gonna start out over here. Uh, Actually, we'll start out over here. Uh, a lot of the plants that we're going to propagate now are subtropicals and tropicals. So um, if anybody has done Chris and I's propagation workshops, whether in the winter or the, uh, the spring, early summer, uh, we're growing, uh, doing a lot of things that are like hardwood cuttings, or uh, soft to semi-hardwood uh, hardwood, yeah, semi cuttings, which with our plants that are more temperate have a specific season more or less that you can take those cuttings well unlike those these tropicals and subtropicals often are unaffected more or less by um, the season and more so, uh, so by temperature that is zapping them uh, they'll keep on growing as long as the temperatures are uh, warm enough for them so these have good cutting material um, most of the summer but as we're approaching fall in about, uh, I think they say at 3.20 fall starts. Coming so up. about 15 minutes fall starts. So um, I know uh, frost is gonna be coming here in about a month and a half probably. I did see some uh, pictures on friends um, Facebook sites the other day, one was in Colorado and they showed snow. So, um, and they were having frost. This okay. was in Steamboat, so uh, uh, Colorado. So anyways, some parts of the country are, are already uh, going into the cold season. Oh, we have a little bit of an advantage here, so. Um, you, you mentioned the cold. You may not want to wait until it's yes, too cold. Yes, exactly. I know things like caladium so, start um, having problems. We'll talk about those a little yeah. bit later on. So um, anyways. So some of the things you can see here in the front, which um, uh, uh, in front of me here are some good things that might propagate really easy and you may have in some of your own gardens. Um, so we're gonna just do a, a general um, propagating of some of these here. So to talk about the propagating itself, anyway, some things you might need. Um, containers. You, if you're a plant person, you have pots sitting around. Our volunteers drop off pots all the time. I don't know. There's a stack of pots over here at our, uh, that someone has left over here from at our uh, plant cart, actually. Um, and you need some clean, fresh media is good to have. Um, I even have a, a small little tray here, which the average person doesn't need to have big trays. So this is a perfect little sized one. You know, like I said, I have some spare pots. Over there, I have some spare media. Um, I even have some plastic bags. I have some sticks. Well, these happen to be some bamboo trimmings. Uh, I can use those um, to, uh, as you'll see later on. And I have labels, which are important to know what you're sticking most of the time, unless you're like me and can't forget the plant name. But the person who gave it to me, I might forget. But um, I'm terrible at people's names. Anyways, but I have, I have actually printed labels for some of our stuff from the Arboretum. And then I did handwrite some. And if you're handwriting, um, the Is labels like we use it, uh, pardon? Is it like mine? I don't know. But if you're handwriting, some labels work real well for writing on. Like the ones we use at the Arboretum are not designed for writing on. But I have some that are. And don't use Sharpie. It will fade away, despite the fact it's supposedly permanent. If you have the right kind of labels that you can write on with pencil, they're great. Um, those do not fade, and you can erase them if you make an error. And also, it tends to be smaller. Uh, you can write smaller and get more information on it. So anyways, I made a few labels for a few personal plants that I have over here. Um, so of course, you need pencil and uh, labels. And that pencil can be multi-purpose. But anyways, so going back to this, I have some rooting hormone. And, uh, I don't think anybody here uh, who's watching probably needs this container of rooting hormone. There's probably a uh, hundred years worth for the average homeowners. How long would right that last there. here? Uh, here, a couple years, uh, actually, and, and we're sticking quite a few cuttings. If you can get a packet, something like this, these are ancient. Actually, this is a, 
Someone gave these to us. They were sealed, but you can get small packets like this. This is root tone. I'm sure there's other ones you can get at your local nursery. Uh, small quantities. And, um, or you can get gels now, which work really well. Um, this one's empty, but I use that as an example. Uh, we are using a lot of those. But a lot of the stuff we're taking cuttings of at this time of the year really don't need a gel. It's pretty. Those are for a little more complicated things. I'd say the Hormon in one is probably, yeah. or, or something comparable like Root Tone, uh, is all you're going to need, which is pretty basic. And some things you don't even need. I would say for tropicals, you may not some need Some of the root was tropicals, you really don't need uh, hormone for. So, anyways, those are some of my tools that I have here um, that we're going to have. Oh, and I forgot, um, I, you may need some extra light. Um, these are some lights I have, and I really like these. I use these for my house plants in my apartment. Uh, because I have an apartment. Uh, but it, you can get some things away from the window or if, if you don't have enough window space to do your plants. And you don't want to put your cuttings like right in a south-facing window that gets full blazing sun. They want more part shade. So um, this has, is an LED light. Uh, there's all kinds of them now. You can get them. They're more wand-shaped. But I like these because um, uh, I can put these in an individual pot. And this one's, like I said, telescope. you can see telescoping. Um, but and this one also, you can put it right next to your computer and have your cutting stuck in. It has a USB adapter. <laughs> uh, and it's also have a built-in timer. This is on 16 hours off 8. So I don't even have to turn it on and off nice. in the morning. Uh, so uh, that's an, a nice cool thing about that. But not, uh, um, that's not a necessity or anything. But you may need some supplemental lighting. So uh, LED lighting and fluorescent lighting works really well with yeah. propagating because they're not warm light. I think we might have a question. Yeah, uh, two questions. Where, do, where did you find this light? That is on Amazon. Where There's else? so many things on Amazon. And you can get them. These, I think, Which for. Is also where this comes yeah, from. This was probably about, I think this is about $25, but you can get them cheaper. Uh, there's some that are like wand lights that have multiple, they have a clip and they'll go multiple directions. Um, and they're about yay long. You can get them for maybe $15 to $20 or less even if you find them now. There's so many options. Or you can go high end and you can get really expensive stuff. But for most of the stuff, you don't need anything that complicated. Uh, or expensive. Do you have another question? Mary Ann is asking about Celosia. Celosia, okay. Can I keep it as a house plant and then move it outside? <sighs> or will I propagate or both? Um, so she wants to keep Celosia indoors. Is it a good idea? You can probably if you have enough light and humidity. I have a feeling you're going to get spider mites. And well, but my guess is Celosia is also more of an annual. Yes, and it annual. tends to be somewhat of an annual. You might be able to force it to uh, keep it vegetative if you're really try yeah. but uh it's probably if she has celosia right now go out take on a dry day and shake the flower head you're gonna have black seeds coming up all uh, all over the place we don't necessarily plant them at too many places in the garden but we have some that have come up for decades in the garden so uh, celosia does reseed they will and most of them nicely. or at least the spicata types um tend to I be had, rather consistent on... I had Plumosa New Look, I believe. And, the do right they come one. true? It, it came true enough. Yeah, yeah. So I years. don't worry about those. Yeah. They're literally weeds in our trials in other parts of the garden at save, times. Save too, your so. treasured space indoors yeah. for something else. Yeah, don't waste your time. It would be harder to keep it through the winter as a plant than it will be as seed. Yeah. So. But going, going back to the light, uh, when I mentioned warm, I'm not talking about the color temperature. I was talking about the heat generated. Fluorescent and LED don't generate heat anywhere near as much as an incandescent bulb. When you're putting, putting your uh, propagated plants inside of baggies or other domes, they can heat up underneath incandescent bulbs. Uh, then we got another question. Carol? And you'll repeat the question. Sure. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, the person's asking, are there uh, rooting hormones that are better than others? And there are differences in them. It's mostly based upon the actual chemical that's in there. You'll find that you have IBA, uh, indobutyric acid, or NAA, napoleon acetic acid. Uh, you might even find one that has IAA, indole acetic acid. IAA is a natural one. It's not very strong. Um, 
you're, you're better off looking up your plant, finding out what your plant needs to root the best, and then getting the rooting hormone that matches it. You might find you have a plant that just needs NAA, but the stuff you have only has IBA. And that's where the differences come in. There are some fancy ones out now that might have things like um, vitamins and I, I'm, I'm gonna make stuff up, sugars and enzymes. I don't even know what they have in there. No, you don't need any of that. It's, it's the rooting hormone that's the important part. Look at the active ingredients and just make sure that the actual type of oxen matches what you need. Uh, today we're talking about tender perennials. Most of these, maybe Tim can confirm, yeah. will probably root like a weed. Yes. Some of these yes. even root on their leaves. They root so, yes. so nicely. Yes, some of them we, so. we, we will do some leaf cuttings on a few of these, yes. So my answer is to you about the rooting hormones goes to more about the uh, uh, the woody plants. And then yeah. things like the Harmodin right here, the number one indicates this is the lower strength version of this. There are larger numbers, so three. one like three, one three is one that we use in the woody uh, uh, propagating, um, just because there's a harder root uh, in the hardwood stage. But one is the, the least potent. And there's some that are like alcohol-based, or that is they use yeah. an alcohol to go through them. And some of those can burn things if they're really tender, but they'll be great on woodies. Yeah. The gels have been really good and not, they're, um, they haven't burnt anything. I mean, but it is more expensive. And that's yeah. why I, I say for the average homeowner. And it doesn't go roots, anywhere near as far. It does not. It does not go any, we go through so, lots of bottles of that. Tim, Tim brought it up, when you're working with a talc, Oxen doesn't dissolve in water readily, so that's the problem with some of the talc products. It dissolves enough, so you're usually okay. With alcohols, you're working with they hormones, can burn. which work at a tiny yeah. uh, concentration. So there's pluses and minuses with, the with them both, but it seems like the gels, which the gel itself is not toxic and it's already dissolved in it, that it has the magical qualities of it's just an overall yeah. great product. It just doesn't go anywhere near as far, but we've been having some really good results yeah. and we use it extensively over here. And we can thank Tony Aben for telling us about that one and the good success. So, yeah, it, basically it depends what you're gonna stick. If it's something simple, yeah. go easy, go powder. If you're going high, uh, uh, more complicated woodies, um, you might go for a higher end um, stuff, but I wouldn't worry. Can you talk about the potting mix? Oh, and the oh. potting mix, that's a good one, yeah. Well-drained well is a key thing for most of them. Um, this I have not have amended, but uh, this, is a, this is just a peat perlite blend, which is pretty much what you, you can find those all over the place at, at Home Depot and Lowe's. You know, that miracle Grow stuff will be perfectly fine. It has some added things for water um, in it often and fertilizer already in it. This, is, this has no nutrient value in this. This has no fertilizer. But um, if it's something that's really water sensitive, you might want to go something that has a higher portion of perlite, for instance, or even down to straight perlite or sand, uh, which are really well drained. But for these, these are going to root readily uh, in just a regular peat perlite that you can buy unamended at uh, this, uh, any box store. But you don't want to use a topsoil a soil-based or a compost-based, um, more than likely, it, they're probably going to be too heavy. You could use them, but they're they're not designed for pots, um, so if it's not as easy to work with. We, we talked about this on Monday's class with Bryce. He just gets a standard potting media and he adds perlite, and perlite it's of the course is the, the white stuff inside the pot, and he just adds extra of that just to increase the porosity inside yeah. or the airspace inside the soil. So that's just a standard mix. This is something you don't want to skimp on. Don't go in your backyard and dig the dirt out of the ground. Don't use the weird stuff that Tim mentioned. Don't reuse a potting soil because yeah, you could have fungus fresh. inside of it. It just gives a nice, good, fresh potting media. Add a little bit of perlite to it if you can. And if you don't, like I said, the, the general stuff you're going to buy in a bag mix of peat perlite blend is probably going to be really good for you, if nothing else. Because mm -hmm. if you, you don't want to have to buy a bag of perlite if you don't have to. It weighs nothing, but it is noxious to work with. So, um, and actually it can wet, cause- Wet it down before yes, you work it with it. It can actually cause dusty. things like, uh, it's not asbestosis, but it's kind of that same idea. It gets in your lungs. It can be really nasty. Well, so you don't want to mess with it. Some perlite has asbestos in it. Uh, exactly. I don't think the commercial ones do yeah. it more. But uh, so there are ones you don't, and if you don't have to deal with it, just go with the, 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 the basic bag blend, unless you're doing something really special. I just hold my breath. Uh, yeah, Carol has another question for us. That would be perfect. Yeah, seed starting was, mix would be good. Yep. Sound good? Talk about some plants now, Tim? Sure. Um, 
I've, I've gotten a whole bunch of different things here. A whole bunch. And a, different, a couple different families that are, some of these are one of the ones you have. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Coleus, which the name now for Coleus I think is Plectranthus, uh, used to be Coleus, then it was uh, Solenostamen. Um, but anyway, so Coleus, easy, 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 easy plant. I don't condone normally rooting something in water, but you can do Coleus in water if you want to. Um, Nothing hard there. That family that includes the coleus is the mint family. And if anybody has grown mint, you know, it's really easy to grow. Some other plants oh, in that family are salvias. And there's a lot of different salvias we grow here in North Carolina. This is one that is not hardy for us. Uh, this is salvia miniata, um, which is a, a really cool one for the hummingbirds. It's a, a subtropical one. Um, and it'll flower off and on most of the summer. Beautiful, intense red flowers. Uh, if anybody with a, an herb or a vegetable garden, basils, and they might not be what you think of as something to overwinter, but we love basil. There we have two different basils here. This is our African blue basil, which we grow this, if nothing else, just to smell in the greenhouse in the, yeah. the winter. It, it, it brightens our days on bad, cloudy days. Uh, and the then basil? this is a mazel basil, um, which is actually... Um, that coleus is out of some breeding work from Florida. Uh, as this is from the same breeding program. This is from uh, uh, the same professor down there in, in uh, University of Florida. Anyways, uh, this is a mazel basil, though. Love this one. It's very disease resistant. That's why I propagate this one. It, it, yeah, they can probably smell it over there. They're wanting me to brush it more. But um, easy to grow in a container. And you can start them and have them for your cooking throughout the winter if you do uh, these now. So um, I'll talk about some of the plants. And then later on, we'll, we'll get into sticking some things. I have another jar here with a few things that are in the Acanthaceae family. So uh, if anybody, uh, uh, let's see, oh, Black-Eyed Susan Vine. This is, a, uh, is Thunbergia alata. This is Thunbergia. I cannot spit this one out without looking. Um, Baticumbia, I can, still can't spit it out. And she, ha, uh, uh, Carol has the, the name and we'll hopefully, look for the, the Thunbergia on my list there with, with the Baticumbiae or something like that. I can't spit that out well, but anyways, this is a sprawling small shrub to a vine if it were fully hardy. In our climate, it, it typically gets two to three feet. If we have a, a mild winter, it will survive. But if we have hard mm. winters, it doesn't survive. But wonderful color here of flowers on that. Uh, some of its, one of its other cousins is Strobilanthes darianus, which you may grow this as per, uh, Persian, Persian shield. shield. Wonderful foliage plant. Mm. Uh, a, a great one to grow as a house plant too. It is short day flowering, so it flowers Ooh. during the winter. So it doesn't always look great in the winter, but if you have an L, or a, a, a light, you can keep it from flowering. Um, That's nice. Because you can adjust the day length that way. Um, long days, it won't flower. So if you had that under mine, which is preset to 16 hours, it doesn't, it won't matter. Uh, another cousin of that, uh, of both of those is, um, I have to spit, uh, oh. look at, I need this one too. This is Odontonema. Uh, two before me, just beginning to flower right now. Spectacular red flowers, hummingbird pollinated um, late fall. Again, it's a borderline hardy plant for us here in this area. So um, anyways, those all fairly easy to propagate from cuttings. And um, I have some other things here. I'm going to squeeze in front of Chris and get my next jar. Um, and I'm going to dump water everywhere. There we I just wanted to rehydrate everything before we got to it later no, on. No, it's already wet out. Yeah, it is. We had the heavy rain. Um, I have two uh, butylons in here. Um, so these are in the Malvaceae. Um, so I have Voodoo, which is this one right here with these big red flowers. And then Chris's favorite, <laughs> Orange Hot Lava. He has one. He can't make it wet. flower. It flowers beautifully here in the garden. <laughs> I, I all over. This week it has from, four flowers on it now. From probably <laughs> March till f uh, December, we will have flowers on it. And then I, it'll just take a short break. But anyway. Mine's had five on it so yeah, far this year. Yeah, he can kill everything. But <laughs> another thing, if anybody has tropical hibiscus that they like, 
Um, those are real closely related to this, and you could propagate them much the same way. Um, I don't have any of those in the garden, but if they get too big and you spend on these really cool hybrids they have now that are multicolored and yellows and oranges or blues, grays, um, you might take cuttings of those. Um, down front, I have uh, a passiflora. Um, Several of the passion flowers are hardy here, the passion flowers. This is Lady Margaret, which we've had in the garden since 2013. But um, in 2018, I was thought we may have almost lost it. Um, but it came back. Um, she's pretty vigorous. She's a cross between one of our, our native Passiflora incarnata and Passiflora coccinea, which is a very tropical red species. But there's a bunch of these that we can grow here. But if you just go a little bit further north, you can't grow them. So for anybody who wants to uh, overwinter a passion flower, the, uh, I mean, you can root those now. And um, you'll do the tip cuttings from these uh, are great. Um, another one I have down in here is um, Tibicina. And this is, I have to look at my names. It's, uh, it's on this one. Oh. It, it, it's Irviliana, and then this is Edwarsii. Um, spectacular um, purple flowers. They are commonly called princess flowers. Again, these will survive our winters here, but they don't always um, grow quickly through the uh, enough to flower real well. So it's often a great thing to start them in advance of getting them um, uh, by having one ready in the house. Um, but these are related to the Rexias, which are native here to the North Carolina. They're one of the, oh. in the Melanstromiaceae, largely a tropical family. Uh, but anyways, really cool leaves, and those will root really easily at this time of the year. Uh, back here I have a cutting hiding. It's just, you might not know what this is from, the, uh, from just this, but this is Brugmansias. Um, the angel's trumpets, we can grow these here in Raleigh. Um, but if, again, if you just live a little bit further north, you're not going to be able to grow these. Um, they die to the ground. We grow them as herbaceous perennials. They get anywhere from 5 to 10 feet tall. Oh, and it looks like we have a question from Carol. While we're on tropicals, tropical butterfly weed yep. I've never rooted tropical butterfly weed, but I think it would be just the same as this. Um, they are typically grown, um, I mean, you could take cuttings now while they're still actively growing. Because it doesn't stop growing, unlike our native, pass I mean, our native Asclepius in, uh, our, our native Asclepius in general. It, it, it keeps on growing and growing. Um, and you should be able to take cuttings as long as you keep it warm. You'd have to bring them inside, of course, but they're not that difficult to root. Could that be one they collect seed from? You could also collect seed from that, too, if, if it sets pods. And one more question. Um, I have a question. Um, how do you clean the pots? Um, so the pots, how do you clean your pots? Any suggestions, Tim? Oh, and if, if you're just doing a few, you can just do them in the sink with some soap and water. Um, I mean, if you're doing masses of them, you can do them in a bleach dip. Um, with, you know, uh, like, I think it's like 10%. You say 10% uh, um, bleach, bleach. solution. Um, but if you don't have to do that, it, it, just, if you're just doing a few, do them in the sink. You can do them in a dishwasher if you don't even mind, too, for that matter, if you just need to do a few. If, if, depending how, how worried you are about uh, messing up your dishwasher. Well, I'm, I'm just imagining if I put a pot in my dishwasher, what would happen? You can do a pre-wash to, to disinfect <laughs> it. Although I'm not thinking about the pot melting. I'm thinking about the uh, other people in the house complaining about that. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander's commenting about that. <laughs> uh, some other things I have down front here are I have some different begonias. I have a Rex type begonia. I have, uh, this isn't a Rex type begonia, but this one, um, it has upright stems, but uh, we'll get into this a little bit later on. I have a, a Semper florens, or a, that is a wax begonia type. Um, and I don't have any of the cane begonias, the, the um, angel wings, but there's some differences in propagating different types of begonias. That's why we'll get to that later on. Um, I also have some Tradescantia, which for us here, this is um, Tradescantia pallida or Setcretia pallida, the purple, I think they'll commonly call purple them purple heart, oh, purple purple heart, heart plant, yeah. yeah. Um, for us here, they're fully hardy, they mm -hmm. just die to the ground, but if you go, again, if you go another zone north, these are house plants that, uh, if you want to keep them through, um, uh, but they're really easy to do that as. So, um, uh, I also have just a little piece of Kufia here, um, this is... I think it's Kufia cyania. I didn't have a label for this one, so you won't find that one over there, Carol. But uh, cyania 
Ash Villa. It's a hardier form of Kufia uh, cyania. Cool. Uh, but um, there's some other Kufias we can grow. They're often, um, the one that's probably most commonly used in bedding would be um, commonly called Hawaiian heather, though it's not from Hawaii, and it's not Mexican, heather. Mexican or Mexican heather. heather. Yeah, Mexican I've heather. heard it different ways. Again, it's a common name. Um, so, but anyways, I don't even know if it's, it might be from Mexico. But anyways, uh, super easy to root those. Um, um, so anyways, and then I have the last couple I have right in this area anyways, are some pelargoniums, or you probably know them as geraniums. These are some sentimental ones I have that I brought from home. These are some that a professor gave me that I, of, of mine from Penn State. So um, these two are, well, no one has the, the two that are in my hand right here, or that is commercially, and this one's commercially available, but you don't see these down here. This is a, uh, a Martha Washington or a Regal type geranium. I have a few oddball things down here, which you. I'll show you a little bit. Uh, I'll show you how to do these. Grasses, something you don't often think about propagating. Um, they're a little different. These are ones I can't get as easily. Uh, this purple one here is one called uh, Penicetum purpureum black stocking. And it, I love this one. It only gets a couple feet tall, you know, eight to 12 feet tall. If you um, joined us last about, week, this mm -hmm. is the plant you saw in the uh, first part of the presentation. In the background. It was, it was in, it's in the, the tropical bed that I highlighted earlier in the season in July. And at that point, I think it was like four feet tall. It's now about eight or so, but um, not readily available at most of the nurseries around here. It's not as hardy as some of the other per, um, per, um, Penicetum purpureums that we've been growing. Uh, it hasn't been reliably hardy for, um, so I always like to stick a few of these. And then this one is a really cool one. And I have to look at the name on this one. Uh, Zia, okay, this is a, actually, a, it's a tender but perennial species of corn. This is Zia perennis, and what's the cultivar, Chris? I don't remember the cultivar. I'll look that's, it up in a moment. I need to, uh, uh, it's, I forget it. It, it, that's what I was having that for, so. Um, winning streak. Winning streak, so, yep, winning is, streak. is the cultivar there. And not cuttings, but, divisions I have dug uh, of a, one of the bananas because um, this is one of the tender bananas. This is um, Musa Siam Ruby. Um, this one's not at all hardy here in Raleigh. We can grow a lot of different bananas. There's probably eight or ten if you probably f try to figure it out that we can at least grow here but this is not one of them that will be hardy in our climate. But uh, I just dug some divisions which is an easy way to keep this one through and I'll we'll just do a little demo on potting that up later on. So we'll get down to sticking a few of these um, and giving some pointers. So I showed you earlier this Tradescantia. Um, I have a terrible cutting, and I have two good cuttings here. There's two different cultivars here. That's why there's two different colors. But um, this is Blue Sioux. And this what we received is Cartouche Giant, which is not overly stable. But anyways, this is your typical um, Tradescantia paleta with the purple foliage. Um, I say this is not a good cutting. This is a flower stalk. Um, this will root, but it will not make a good plant. If it does produce a plant at all, it would be viable. Uh, it'll just sit there. It might try to flower, but it's not going to produce anything that's to, to keep over. These, on the other hand, these are just vegetative shoots. Um, very easy. Um, We'll stick them in, uh, you know, your root hormone. Actually, you probably don't even need rooting hormone for this one. This is one you can just push into the, right into the ground. And they're a little bit brittle, uh, though. Uh, this does have a thick stem. I have this pencil here for multi-purposes. It's for writing labels, but also to make some holes. So uh, the Tratus Cancha, um, I'm not even in rooting hormone on these. I cut these just before we started. They don't need to be recut even, but you can... Uh, start a new one of those really easily uh, just little, by doing that. It's a little difficult with that one, but I like to pull the bottom leaf off of them. Yeah, right I didn't really. Just, just to expose the node a little bit. Like that, we can do that. Yeah. There is a node here and there's a node there. And They're real but, soft stems so they could break, so be careful yes, with that. Those super easy to root, yeah. and it, it makes a great house plant too, so uh, it will work throughout the winter. Uh, my sister-in-law has had one for years at um, their house in Pennsylvania, and it, they torture that poor thing, <laughs> and it survives. But anyways, um, oh, so I think we have, have a, a question, question, Carol. The question is, name the corn-related plant again. Zia perennis. Is the... Zia is the genus for corn. Yep. So Z-E-A perennis, P-E-R-E-N-N-I-A. 
Uh, S. Er, S. Perennis. Perennis. Yep. Okay. And then winning streak. And winning streak. I don't know where you can get it. It's one we were given, and it's not being commercially produced right now, and it's patented. I don't know why. It's a wonderful plant. Oh, so it's one we can't propagate for them either. Though. We can't sell it. So. Uh, <laughs> Where at? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we were asking and, uh, about the uh, Siam Ruby, the banana we show. Yeah. Paul lives down in the, I think, Wilmington area. Yeah, that's, and we were mild the last couple winters. They're milder down there. Yeah. Uh, he said that he was growing it in Brunswick City and it survived last winter. Um, that's probably had a zone 9B winter last year. Well, we were, we were 9A. A on the edge of 9A, yeah. 8B here this past two winters. I would not expect it to make it that yeah. for us. But down there, there, that's really warm. It barely freezes, uh, it froze probably the last two winters down there. So that doesn't surprise me. Again, there's some variation on some of these plants for us are perfectly hardy. Well, I, like I said, there's some that just a little further north, these are not going to be hardy. But there, again, on that other side, there's some of these that will be hardy for those uh, coming in, tuning in from further south. But so. Siam Ruby is easy to overwinter. Yes. Yes. We'll get to that one just a little bit. Yeah. Um, some other things here, much like I'll, I'll, I'll go into some of the begonias since there's some differences here. This is a, um, a wax type begonia. Uh, it's a begonia, uh, uh, begonia Semper Florence Culturum selection. I did not put this one in, uh, it's not on our list of anything. I did mm -hmm. not print a label. This is just some I stole from the trials. Again, like the Trade Escantia, you get flower stalks. There's a flower That's stock awesome. here, flower stocks here, flower stock there. There is no vegetative growth on this. Um, that, that is to produce a plant that will branch. If you plant, uh, take a cutting of this, it will root, but it'll just keep on going and going without branching. You will have one stock forever. Uh, it may keep flowering, but it will just be one stock flowering. If you take a cutting off of something like this, which is vegetative, you will get a plant that will branch and have um, multiple stalks like it should and yeah. make a nice bush. Um, and uh, the wax begonias, you can also, if, if, if you keep them in a pot, you can get the cutting, you can get basil shoots earlier uh, in the spring too and take cuttings. But it's, um, it's generally a good idea overall to avoid flowers on yeah. your stems that you want to cut. So almost no matter what you're doing, skip the stems of flowers if unless, you can. Yeah, unless you have no other material. So. Uh, going back to begonias, okay, and then another begonia, um, or the, the cane begonias, which this is not, uh, that is like angel wing type begonias. Those, you can take cuttings of stem cuttings with no problem, they will, they will root. If you take a leaf cutting, it may root, will not produce a viable plant. Um, oh. But, and then there's other begonias which are kind of intermediates here. This one um, is... Uh, begonia little brother Montgomery which is one of our favorites here we've had it in the garden now for three years in the laugh house two mild winters there so um, I don't know how it's going to be long long term but I'd say it's definitely a zone 9 maybe a zone 8 a B uh, in a normal year but anyways this is one you can take stem cuttings um, so we can simply I can make a couple cuttings here I'm gonna go uh, here I'm gonna actually I'm gonna save this too um, and we're going to do a cutting like right here. So I have a cutting here, a cutting here. And let's see, did I have another one? No, I didn't. I have a leaf. We'll save that for later. But anyways, yeah, these, are t these are two really good cuttings here. This one is at a node, which is excellent. Doesn't have to be, though. Begonias are pretty liberal on making roots. The node is where the leaf attaches to the stem. And ideally, you should cut right below it. And node. that's what I did in this case. But to give me some extra material, I, I cut uh, off the top here. And I have another shoot here. Um, this one does have some flower beds. I'm going to take them off. But um, this one, I, in this case, I have an inner node uh, here. So I have the stem in between the nodes. So these I will dip just briefly in. A little bit of uh, rooting hormone, which mainly it's for the fungicide. There's a little bit of fungicide in this, more or less, that helps to keep things from rotting. Um, begonias root very easily and don't necessarily have to be uh, rooted with um, uh, rooting hormone. But anyways, again, just rather simple here. Drill a hole, and we can 
Begonias have real soft stems, so making a hole with the pencil yes. helps out or helps not to break the stem when you insert it. So anyways, and another way I can do this one, this one will root from leaves as well. Not all the, the stem forming uh, uh, upright ones will form, um, will root from leaves and produce a viable plant. But this is one that will, this, oh, here, I'll save that, Chris. Oh, I was just uh, oh. getting you a good visible area to work with. So I'm gonna actually see. gonna stick oh. this right there. I'm gonna save space. I only have X number of pots. I might not use them all, but anyways, I just dip the very tip of that begonia in there. And if you were a real begonia file, you would mutilate this leaf into little sections and you'd display them out and you'd put rooting hormone in little cut spots and it would theoretically root all over the place. I do it simple. You get really vigorous plants this way. I'll just drill a hole and I will push this down just so it's barely touching the, the, where the leaf sinus meets the, um, right here, meets the, the soil, which I'll show you again on some of these others. And it'll root right there where it touches at the soil surface. And you can take those out. But it'll, I have that basically down to the, the, the soil. I, have the, I left a part of the, the leaf petiole on just to anchor it into the ground, um, more or less is what I did that for. Um, but you'll typically get, you can get one to multiple plantlets out of that. So, and if you, anybody's growing Rex begonias, those are typically grown either by dividing the rhizome or leaf cuttings. And this is one, uh, I have to look at the cultivar on this one. This is Begonia Painter's Palette. It's in the T-Rex series um, and really spectacular leaves. And anyways, for again, this one, easy from uh, leaf cuttings. Um, again, we're just gonna go like, like this. And I could do multiples, we're just gonna do one for now. And like I said, I just left a little piece of the petiole here, which that's gonna help me secure it into the ground. Just a tiny bit of rooting hormone. And we're gonna push this in here. And I'm gonna push it the whole way down, just like that, and I'll firm in around the base. That is right at the soil level. And I will get plantlets forming here. Like I said, if you really wanted to, if you were a begonia fowl, you could notch this leaf and you can make other little plantlets form. But I get nice, vigorous plants whenever I just do it this way. So um, I keep it simple. Question, Carol? The question is, any comment on how to propagate palm leaf begonia? Those, I think you probably want to do as a stem cutting, but it would probably... That was propagating oh, how to palm, prop leaf palm leaf begonia, begonias. Which I'm guessing they're probably... Um, what is that one? It's a big one. Um, I can't think of the species on it, but I would think it would be more like the brother, um, little brother um, um, uh, Montgomery here. It's gonna, it'll grow from stem cuttings, but you might be able to do it as a leaf cutting as well. Give it a try. Yeah. It'll probably root, uh, the leaf will root. Whether it'll form a plantlet, I don't know. I think it should. Uh, there's actually several su uh, subsections within begonia. There's literally thousands of species of begonias. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, those are some bigger ones. My volunteers this morning were asking me about begonias. That's why I did a whole little thing on begonias. Um, the rest of this is pretty much all the same. So we're just going to do a couple of things here. We're going to do some amazal, um, the basil, so that we can have this you know, super easy mint relative. And these will root in a matter of Seconds. a week or two. You will have nice, well-rooted plants. So uh, to make a nice full pot that you can harvest from shortly, I'm just going to go like, like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed things up for myself here. I'm not being picky. Uh, these will root all along the stems wherever. They are just like their cousins, the colgus. Uh, they are not picky. I could do nodal, uh, a cutting right at the node, but I'm not wasting my time. Um, no I'm just gonna do relative. these. We're gonna take these very simple. And I probably don't even need this rooting hormone, but we're gonna do a little bit. Uh, how many cuttings do I have there? I have five. We're gonna just go one, two, three, four, five. And I'll just go like, I'm gonna put these all in one pot. Once they would root in, you could separate these out. But if you're growing these for the winter just to have a pot of basil in your windowsill, um, this might be just as effective to do it this way. It will kind of keep them a little, um, oh, I have that in the way, um, a little closer together so they'll be less likely to get mite issues. But to get these rooted, and this will work for any of these, like the begonias and stuff, um, you can use just a simply a bag. Uh, and this is where my sticks of bamboo come in. 
I'm going to put that in there just to secure it so it doesn't go down too far. And let's see if I can do this without ripping them out of the, uh, the, the media. We're just going to go something like this. We're going to make a little uh, greenhouse here. And if you're like me. Have a bunch of lights. I have a bunch of lights. <laughs> And this is really convenient for one pot. Bag. I know, I had that from earlier. Ah, is that what yeah. you're <laughs> Perfect. And I plug my, plug this in, uh, put it in a, a bowl next to my, uh, a saucer to keep it from getting my desktop dirty and I put it right next to my computer and plug it in. <laughs> but anyways, so that's an option you have, you know, right there. You, you could put this next to your window or whatever, you know. I would um, take this out. Yeah, it, it's going to fall over right now. Yes. But anyways, so you get the gist there. But just something to hold the uh, plastic up off the foliage. Keep an eye on it to see if there's a little bit of moisture after a few days uh, so that's will increased humidity in there. This will work for almost all of these. Um, so and it looks like we, I need to move on to other things. We are, are getting shorter on time. Yep. Um, so. Do you have a request to do the angel's trumpet? No. Yeah. Actually, they're really hard. Actually, it, depending where you're at here, you can literally cut down the whole plant the night before it's going to get a freeze and store the whole stems if you want, or just stick them in a in, in by this, by through storage, the winter, like the basement or the garage. basement or garage. Yeah. You don't have to do anything, or you just can take softwood cuttings like these, and these root rather easily. Um, you can do a, a single node cuttings, so like this. Uh, or a multi-node cutting, and again, just some basic rooting hormone. This does have some big leaves. I might go and shrink this just a little bit, uh, just so to keep them from falling out of the pot. I don't like to do this unless I have to, uh, because you want that plant to what's called transpire. If you take off too much surface area, it's not losing enough moisture to make it pull moisture or pull water up through it, and it just sits there and rots in moist soil. And what about the flowers? Oh, uh, yeah, I do have some flower buds. Chris did notice. I forgot. I'm just doing this quickly. Hope you wouldn't flowers notice. Flowers don't add anything. No, they aren't. Away, so get ready so we're going to get off all the flower buds here. There's another one hiding in here. Um, anyways, so again, just some basic rooting hormone here. And you noticed I poured rooting hormone into a separate container. Don't dip directly in this, and definitely don't dip directly into a big thing like that. In theory, this is a single serve, so they can dip into that, but that means you're done with it. Yeah, you want to discard away. that. Don't save it. And then I'm going to drill my little holes. Not that I really need that for these. No. It's super easy um, here. So, so Carol said we had a question, too. OK, another question, Carol? I pre-moistened the media, so yes. Yeah, we were, the question was, how much watering do we do? And was our media pre-moistened? And yes, it was pre-moistened. How much watering you do might depend on the, the conditions in your house, mm -hmm. uh, where they're at light-wise. If it's in a sunny window, it's going to evaporate more, um, transpire more, so it's going to need more water. You're just going to have to keep an eye on them. More or less, especially now, for the first couple weeks. A propagating or plant you're propagating should not be in a sunny window. No, it wants to be in a bright, window, a bright window, direct, but not direct yeah. sun. You, you put a plant in a bag in a sunny window, and it cooks. And you know what's going to happen? It's 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 going to cook inside that. But a, a a plant in a bag or humidity dome that is totally sealed should not dry out quickly at all. So you don't even need to check it for a few weeks. Yeah. But look for dew on the bag. As long as it has some dew on there and it looks like it's nice and moist, you should be fine. I would probably check the first day or two just yeah. to make sure there is some yeah, moisture, yeah. to make sure the media was moist yeah. enough. But after that, yeah. I often like to water mine. Like the soil's moist, but I would probably water that in just to mm -hmm. ensure a good contact yeah. with the soil myself. That's how yes. I do mine. Of course, that's, that's perfect. Carol again? Some question. question is, will you Will you use warm or cold water so it absorbs well? I use whatever comes out of the tank. Exactly. The, yeah. the water coming out of your faucet, unless it's, it's super cold, enough. is probably fine. Yeah. Unless you're putting it, it's, it's, you're watering out of the hose that was sitting out on a, for a 35 degree night, you're probably fine. And even that would be fine if that's all you had. Uh, no, you're probably doing this, in, this is an indoor project. And I don't know if I would use chilled water. No, I wouldn't use chilled water. the 30s, and that's, some of your tender plants don't like it below 40, 45. So but I mean, different. It, just your regular tap water would be fine. Yeah. You don't have to warm it like you would the bottle for the baby. So. <laughs> How big will the vermentia be by the end of the winter? 
It just depends. I can't say how, uh, how big, big is Brugmans, the, the yeah. Brugmans going to get by the end of the winter. It's, it, again, it depends. It depends on how well it grows in, in your house. Your house is not going to be optimal, but it'll keep it alive. It'll get you something started. So if you use the cut stick method and you just keep it in a, um, a cool area that's dark, doesn't even need a pot, it'll be as big as you put it in there in the, in the <laughs> fall, which is great because they don't get things like spider mice. They don't need to be watered. You don't have to have a friend take care of them when you go on a Christmas break. So I think that's ideal. And I think the volunteers that do that, I, f I forget who, who did that, um, I think about Nita. Doesn't she put that like in a glass of water and, and you might. start getting them going you in could. Uh, late, yeah. late, late February and pots them up in March? And then they're ready to go when it warms up in the spring. That's, that's what I would do if I can get away with it. But if, I mean, if you're doing cuttings like this, they might be just a little bigger than this, or they might be, I mean, depending on how, how the conditions are in your house. You're just really trying to keep them alive through the winter because you don't know, unless you have a conservatory to put them in. Depends or on a, how many spider mites it gets. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you're just keeping it over the winter. It might be anywhere from four inches to a foot and a half tall, depending on how well it does in your house. Another question? When do you start fertilizing? When do you start fertilizing? I wouldn't start fertilizing until you have roots. Yeah. Because you're really not pulling many nutrients until uh, yeah. that's there. Um, if you're using, like I said, miracle Grow media, it's going to already have some fertilizer in it. You probably won't need to even fertilize once you start having roots. But if you're using the stuff we are using right here, there's nothing in this. This is totally de uh, denude of any nutrient value at and all. While they're indoors, treat them as a house plant, yeah. water them at the rate for a house plant. Yeah. It's going to be a lower than it is for the outdoor Yeah, because they're not going to be as vigorous as they would be outdoors. Not, not even close. So any other questions before I head on to uh, uh, the last couple things Carol I have over one. here? Another one? Yeah. Why can't you dip the base into the rooting corn? You don't want to dip the base you, in your clean root Why root can't root you dip yeah. the base of your plant yeah. into the rooting hormone? Yeah. It, it, it's because you're contaminating this whole yeah. bottle of it. You don't, it, it can have disease uh, and mm -hmm. it puts dirt in there. And it, it's, you don't want to do that. You want to keep this sterile. Yeah. So you want to dump it into a separate container. And when we're done with this, it will go. So strilly is it. definitely important, but your cuttings are also moist. And if you put the moisture inside your container of hormone, you could start um, adding moisture inside there. You don't so know what's on the outside of this. Bad faster, so. There could be fungal spores yeah. on that cutting uh, that you just stuck in there. And then you've now inoculated that whole container full of fungal spores. Or just got it wet. Yep. You don't want that. Any don't others? Huh? huh? <laughs> I'm not sure what they're asking. I think we, I think we stumped us. Okay. Um, and what is the plant that you just propagated? I this one here? Th that's the Brugmansia, the angel yes. trumpet. So that, what, what was the plant we just propagated? That's the angel's trumpet or Brugmansia. Thank you. And so we just had it was a question. Inca Sun, in, it was the cultivar. We just had a question in the chat we did not quite understand. So if you want to ask it a different way in the chat, we can go ahead and help uh, with it or in just a little bit, we'll be to the live Q&A and we can a you can ask it out loud. So go I'm going to go uh, over to this end and get a few things. Okay. So that's why I'm here. I showed you these grasses over here. Here's some I prepped in advance just to get them. Thing. I stripped all the leaves off these. So what we're going to do is we're going to take stem cuttings of these grasses um, so that I have them. This is the corn. And I don't know if you can see that there's nodes here. Just like on any other plant, they have nodes. And if you, has anybody grown up in the country like me and grew, walked through a cornfield? Mm -hmm. And actually, you get roots coming out of the, uh, like on this penicetum here. Uh, you'll get these aerial roots. Same thing, there's adventitious roots at each of these nodes. So what we can do here is, since I'll take cuttings, I'm going to make them so I can fit them into this little flat right here. Um, I'm going to lay them horizontally is what I'm actually going to do. I'm just going to throw some back, stuff back there. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to get rid of it. You're going to have some people coming over here and looking in the Asian jasmine for those cuttings. Uh, those aren't really. There's nothing there. That's the <laughs> internode. There's nothing to root there. So anyways, this is all I need. I have, I, I can get, theoretically, it might produce plantlets at each yeah. node. If, uh, it's, these are real tight. I can't get in here real well, but there's actually... Oh, buds. A bud right there. And 
it'll throw, on one side it'll throw a root, so probably on this side, the buds on this side of the, um, the stem, it would throw a root over here. So I'm going to plant this horizontally so that once, uh, depend, regardless of which side uh, mm -hmm. it, the shoot comes from, the root will be on the other side and it'll be in contact. So I'm just simply going to kind of push these down into the flat. I have everything in the way. It's not even, it's barely touching. Half in, half out? Yeah, half in, half out. Now, are any of these grasses super prickly and are gonna hurt themselves off? No, these are not. Okay, that's good. Um, you can do the same thing with this. Um, the other thing you can do, you can also do these vertically. You don't have to do them horizontally, but vertically, I mean, horizontally works really well because you can get multiple shoots out of the same um, cutting that way. Because I could get different, uh, say, three to five plants out of each of these sticks coming up off. And then later on, if, if they take, I can cut them apart at the nodes, or at the inner nodes, I should say. On these, um, this has a lot further, a bigger uh, inner nodes. So it's a little bit more, comp uh, it takes up a little more space. So I'm only gonna get one to three on some of these, but again. Let me show off the. Uh, yeah, we already have a plant right there forming at that. Got a little bud coming and it's already rooted uh, and that's what's gonna happen with those down inside the soil. So. If you do stick them in a pot, you have to keep on, uh, uh, you have to know who's up and who's down. In this case, it's pretty easy. And we could just, I'm just going to drill a hole here, use my pencil, and push it down in there. That would work. You could get an easily get a cutting right there. Or, again, I can do the same thing here. I'm going to put them in horizontally. This one only has one node, so I'm not even worried about it. But simple. Um, for those. Not so bad. I think we might have a question, Carol. Okay. And I'll let you repeat it because I always forget. No hormone on the grasses, customer. So no, uh, should we use a hormone on the grasses or not? You saw what this one looked like. It had already rooted all on its own and already had the bud. Of course, the hormone's only used for rooting responses. Tim didn't use it. I, I didn't use it. It's, it's kind of difficult to put it on this one, to tell you the truth, because you're laying them horizontally. And it's just... It'll root it where it makes contact. You know, I only need a handful of plants. Can, I don't need to do lightly season nah, your dish. I'm not going to do that. No, um, okay. They already have roots initialized in there in reality at those nodes that are ready yeah. to go. So it's when, pretty easy. When you easy. peel back the petioles, and I think he's gotten rid of them all, you actually might find Pr yeah primitive or uh, some some roots starting to form a, in there. A little root popping out on it, and I don't see one on this one. But if you ever see just a little tiny root initiated. That doesn't need a hormone. The hormones to initiate a root. Once you see one, that process has already started. So that was our one thing here. And I said about the banana. So we're just going to go right here. Okay. We're going to go down to the ground right here. So I, I have three plants here that I, uh, I dug up. You know, the two smaller ones. And they'll be easy. I just have to put them in some media. Um, if you're growing bigger bananas, you can actually dig them and just store them, like Chris said, with the Brugmansia leaning up against the wall in your basement, if yep. you have a basement. Um, really easy uh, to do these uh, bananas. Uh, if you have Musa Baj, do you like we have in the garden? Don't dig it up. <laughs> you don't need to. Don't hurt your back. Yeah, but bananas were really popular in Texas, but oddly, they didn't sell any of the hardy ones. We always just had the traditional bananas. Oh, yeah, tropical ones. And they would sell them first thing in the spring just as bare root stems like Tim's showing you right there, which, of course, most of it's not a stem. Just and that's to, what just I was going to talk about. Out. Oh, can and, you give me my um, pruners? And that was the way to overwinter them. You would just dig them up and put them in a brown paper bag and put them in your unheated garage. Uh, this one's a little too tall. And... You're going to freak when I, see, uh, I do this. Oh, I cut the stem. No, I didn't. This is not, bananas are not trees. It drives me crazy when I see people say banana tree. Uh, bananas are the largest herbaceous plants. So actually what looks like a trunk on a banana is just tightly wrapped leaves, the leaf petioles. So all I did was cut off the leaves. It'll be pushing. <laughs> It may have already started to push a new leaf here, so. They do it pretty fast. They, they <laughs> grow so quickly. So, running out of time? Uh, okay, that's fine. Okay. That's why I was going this way. So we're I, almost done. I thought that was a clue that we had four questions. <laughs> yeah, so how much longer do you want to go? Do you want to go? 
I have one more little thing over there. We'll so that's one more. easy for the bananas. Don't worry about chopping off the top no. is what I'm saying. In fact, there might, are no st uh, stems above that ground. That might be ideal. Who wants a big tall banana in their exactly. house in the winter time? Exactly. So I'm I'll gonna do one more quickly. thing over here. So like Chris was saying about caladiums, or actually there's two I have things here. So caladiums are one thing. You may have these in your yard. Um, now is not really the time to propagate them, but it's the time to start saving them. Mm -hmm. With the cooler nights, these are gonna start uh, dying down. But before you lose track of them, you can dig them or keep track of them before the foliage is totally melted away. They will not like staying through our winters here in Raleigh. Um, though occasionally you'll get one to survive, it's so rare, uh, it's not worth it, but you can easily overwinter them. So pretend it got frosted or uh, had melted down or you just had time to dig them. Um, easy to keep caladiums through the winter. Um, they don't want to be cold. Nope, keep them so warm. So you can put these in your closet. All I do is, I mean, you can do this multiple ways. You can use bulb bags like this or an onion bag. Um, and put them in um, and let them dry out and just store them in, either in a paper bag or if you have lots of them, you can put them in a box and then just throw those in your closet for the winter. Get them out in May. Yep. They don't really want to get going early in the season. We planted a whole bunch in the white garden in mid-June. They look spectacular now. Yeah. If we had started them in May, even with our warm summers here, they're still just gonna say, it's too cold, I'm not coming up. So um, there's no sense in forcing them. So, so we visited easy. Brent and Becky over at Brent and Becky's Bulbs, and they said, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, don't expose your caladiums to like 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, because at that point, they're not gonna be good for overwintering anymore. So you do wanna get them fairly early. Uh, and also, I believe their cooler that they stored their caladiums in was they're heated. 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. they want indoor conditions, unlike so many other bulbs that we grow, uh, grow and store uh, or grow in the garden in so general. So the closet's a good idea. The closet is perfect. Definitely not your own. I store them in my office on top of a filing cabinet in, in <laughs> here at the Arboretum. So another thing I have here, you probably don't know what this is, but this is the fruit structure from our Colocasia gigantea Thailand giants. It's a borderline species of elephant ear that we grow here. And if, I mean, if you've seen them, you know what I'm talking about. They get the little leaves. Huge. Uh, yeah, the little leaves. But they get white flowers in the summer. And most winters, they don't make it here. They will occasionally. They're not reliable, but they're so easy from seed. Um, so I let them flower and um, you can, go and you can uh, pick them after, about, I think it's about two months, two to three months, um, the, the seed are ripe enough. And I don't know if Alexander can see these here. This is the inflorescence after I've taken off the, sp uh, the spath. This is the spadix uh, and the fruit that have formed on the spadix from the flowers. And each of these fruit has several, you know, 10, 15, 20 seeds that are minuscule in it. You would think a plant that gets eight to 10 feet tall and has leaves as big as this table would have an enormous seed. No, tiny. But what I do, I've heard people, they put them in the blender to get the seeds out and then sift out the, with water. And it's oh. like, that's a nightmare. Because these have, the chemicals in these actually, it can make, burn your skin if you're not, if you're sensitive. So I don't mess with that. I put this on my desk and let it dry out for a month or two until it's totally dry. And then if you just take a, uh, a sieve like you'd use to sprinkle uh, um, powdered sugar on something, you rub this against it and grind it all up and you can sift out seeds. And then you sow them. I sow them in January, actually. And you can literally fit a hundreds in a pot this big. And they're just tiny. They're tiny, tiny things. So anyways. That's an easy way to overwinter it. We planted ours out in the end of May and they're in big leaves and flower, have been flowering for two months. Yep. So um, there's, it's such an easy way to do it. The regular Colocasia esquilentas, here in Raleigh, we don't need to dig most of them. Uh, and, but if you're further north, you can dig them. You can treat them much like you would your caladiums. So, but that I, one doesn't make a really good This one doesn't organ. produce much of a storage organ to, to bring in. So I don't worry about it, and I just collect some seeds. But that one can sometimes overwinter in this yeah, area. Yeah, it, but it's not, uh, not reliable enough that I would say. Uh, and sometimes the, the plant the next year isn't, doesn't have the vigor the first year plant has. Yeah. So 
I just start from scratch. Well, I think Tim's run through all yep. those plants, and we might have run through all the questions, but maybe we have a few left. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go on mic. So okay, great. I'm going to ask the questions that uh, some people do angel trumpet cuttings and expect blooms, but if the cutting is not from above the Y, it will not bloom until the Y forms. This is the question that okay. we had some uh, I'm guessing the Y just means it's branching. It's nice just maturing, yeah. yeah. They often, for us, they don't flower until midsummer at the earliest. And the one that cultivar we have here, this is a compact growing one. It only gets five to six feet tall, which is small for a Brugmansia. Often they're eight, 10 feet tall, and they don't flower until even later here in our climate. Um, in the wild, or in further south, they're actually woody. Um, shrubs, uh, they, uh, like in Florida and the Central and South America where they're native, and they're actually woody shrubs, they, and small trees even for that matter. So they have to get up and have mature growth more or less, I think, before they'll actually flower. With and, and, and any of these are going to have to have a certain amount of strength to them to yes. flower. And some of these things, this doesn't flower until right now. Yeah. Um, these are mid to late summer, you know. Um, and some so. of those are responses to the, the day length. length. Yeah. Day length. It, but I think Brugmansias are also, um, they can be I day think, length, can't they? I don't know if it's day length, lunar cycles is what I've heard. Oh, really? That they'll flower heavily at different uh, times in the, the lunar cycle. I don't remember what part of the lunar cycle. So. Cool. With multiple sticks in the same pot, what yep. is the spacing between sticks, uh -huh. i.e., how many sticks per four-inch pot does it vary with a plant? It just depends on the size of the cutting and how long is it going to be in that pot. I'm just doing this to, to get it rooting. You don't always have that much space in your, on your windowsill at home. So, um, you know, you can put four to six in there just so there's some space between them. I put three Brugmansia cuttings in this six inch pot here, or one quart pot. Um, long term, I would not leave that. I would uh, let them root in. I'm using this kind of as a, a rooting tray. Um, just to root them in here. And then once they've rooted out, I would divide those up into um, uh, individual pots. When do you propagate spider or hurricane lilies? Those are bulbs, and they're fully hardy um, for us here in the Raleigh area. You could do them in the green now, I think, but it's by division. So, I mean, you could really do it almost any time. Ideally, probably when they're dormant, but you could still do it at this time of the year because you can find them. You know where they're at in your landscape. I, I, when they're finished flowering, before they start to throw leaves. I think I would easy. do that uh, ideally. I think I would do that just as they're going dormant so you can find them yeah. with their leaves turning brown. Because they're probably sending out roots now. I've yes, not, they I've would be. dug one up. We so have you. potted them here. Uh, Doug has brought some in before, and we've potted them in the green and they grew really well. Oh, great. So, I mean, you can find them at this time of the year, but you could also do, you can do them almost any time of the year. I just wouldn't do them right when they're flowering unless you have to because you're going to destroy the display. But right after they're flowering is an ideal time because you can find the, the clump. That's half uh, the battle sometimes. And, and, you know, and, you're, um, and it's typically, at least with Lycoris radiata, if that's what you're talking about, um, they, um, they don't produce leaves until a little bit later. So uh, until the fall, early winter. Uh, so you have a few weeks in their leeway. Uh, the rhodophiallas, which might be um, for the hurricane lily uh, or blood, oxblood lilies, they uh, start making leaves as soon as they uh, finish flowering. So. And there are other ways to propagate bulbs, yes. but that's not the that, topic That's of the today. easiest so way, look, yeah. So look that one yeah. up. It's kind of cool. You, you can, can scale, scale them, and I don't know the, all the ins and outs of that. So next question, Carol. Can you put potted caladiums in a dark, warm spot in a pot? to dry out and store the whole pot? Yep, perfect. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, can you put uh, just a pot of caladiums, let it dry out, and store it dry through the winter in a warm spot? Yes, that's a perfectly fine way to do it. The only thing is, in the spring, I would refresh the media. So, um, uh, so you'd want to be repotted anyways in the spring. And that's a perfect time then to divide the corms. What about growing hostas from seeds? That's not really what we're talking about now, but there, I'm not the specialist on that. Tony Avent would be the one, but I think they need vernalization. So you'd collect the seed, you'd have to vernalize it, that is, give it a cold treatment, and uh, they should germinate. And stratify. Or stratify. Yeah. I should, thank you. Vernalization Strat is chilling a, an existing plant. That okay, that's it. Stratifying the seed, uh, giving them a cold yeah. treatment, to, and ca uh, cause them to germinate. I don't think they germinate right away without that, but I could be wrong. So like when Tim was talking about uh, germinating the elephant deer from seed, that one comes true to type. 
your hosta is going to come up who knows what. Yeah. Could be worse, could be better, yeah, could be the same. You don't know what's going to happen. They might go to the hosta society online and yeah. see what they are recommending. And your variegated patterns. They're not going to come true. Yeah. Green leaf uh, ones will be fine, but if they're blues and greens, or that is variegated patterns, you're not going to get that. They at all. So divide, divide your hosta. Carol, question? I routinely cut off the ugly old wet leaves off the base of my red banana. Should mm -hmm. I be leaving those on as protection for the stalk? No. For, for the mean, winter or just for, for looks? Because I'd get rid of them too because they're ugly. Yeah, it's just that that's an aesthetic thing. The question was, should you cut the, uh, oh, I guess they can hear now. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would, I mean, it's, it's, it's a totally an aesthetic thing. Yeah. Um, being that the, if it's Moose, uh, Siam Ruby, for instance, and it not being hardy for us, I would not worry about that. If you're trying to overwinter, the, the bud on the banana is actually at or just below the ground level. It is not up six feet. It is right here is yeah. where, the, where the meristem is. That is the only, the only place part. It's, yeah. So if, if you're trying to overwinter it, you just throw leaves over it and yeah. keep it somewhat dry. Um, can you use stem cutting for Persian shields leaves? The leaves, leaves would not work on Persian shield. Stem cuttings, yes. So growing a plant by a leaf is a fairly rare trait. Yeah. Begonias is one of those few plants you can grow from a leaf cutting. Things in the African violet yeah. family, yeah, just a few funky things like uh, in the hyacinth, what used to be hyacinth ACE, things that are related to the hyacinth, well, uh, well, like pineapple lilies pineapple will work lilies, that way. Yeah. Um, and leadbordias and drimias and things like that. But it's an exception to the rule. And How it's often a tropical trait, so things like Sansevierias will do it too. It's like, I don't think you can do, like I said, the hyacinth ACE, yeah. the hyacinth family. I don't think you can do it for hyacinth, yeah. but you can do it for rel close relatives of it. How about hibiscus, like Roselli? Rossi? Oh, Rosella. Rosella. That, I don't know if that one's a, a true annual or not. It, but you should be able, I would think you can do, no, they do that as a cutting. You could do that, yes, definitely. You could do that as cuttings right now. It does come into flower late, so for us, You'd have to try to get shoots that are non-flowering. Um, you can also grow it from seed, I think is a, a common way of doing that. Um, so if it flowers late, do they need to prevent it from flowering inside it, their house? If, if you put, give it artificial light, like I <laughs> adjust the day length, it, it's, a, it'll, it's a long night. Right, a long night. The, the, the true a, thing they sense is the length of darkness. The long night uh, uh, nights cause them to flower. So if you can alter the day length, yeah. Um, while, uh, you're, while you're holding up the light, there was a question earlier about, did you uh, get that off of uh, Amazon mm -hmm. by um, searching really. for uh, plant LED lights? plant lights. LED plant lights. Yeah, Sorry. and there's thousands. Okay, and how do you propagate Setscrisia? Setscrisia? Um, I thought it was Transcanthia, but... Yeah, Tradescantia is the going name currently. Setcretia is an, another older name. It's a synonymous name. It's a synonym. Okay, and we already talked about how to yeah, propagate Yeah, it's just really that. easy stem cuttings. Again, Super don't easy. go for flower stalks. Yeah. Go for shoots that are totally vegetative, which are coming up from the base of the ground. Yeah, I've, I've seen even in our green. Those will root, but they will not. Just, just things that look like that. And it's, it's junk. It's yeah. junk. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have to put a plastic bag over every small pot. You want to I mean, talk more about that? Well, um, I meant to bring it. Sorry for not. If doing I had, that a, today. if you had a big garbage bag or a, yep. uh, or a, a dome. So I, when I do things at home, I often have them in a, a full size flat, and you can fit the full size flat inside of a, um, a dry cleaner bag very nicely. And just like Tim used the bamboo sticks. You can put a few bamboo sticks inside your flat and put the uh, big dry cleaner bag over it. Uh, they also um, do commercially produce uh, humidity domes for flats that you can just put right on them. They're built to be the same size and that will serve the same purpose. They may not work real well for some pots, but what you can yeah. also do is the somewhat clear tote boxes yep. and flip it over, use the bottom uh, as the dome and the lid as a tray. So when I'm talking about humidity domes, I'm not talking about a seed dome that's this tall, because yeah. your cuttings will be far taller than that. They make, I don't know, seven, eight inch tall humidity domes that when added on top of your flat are quite high. Yeah. And you want to get those. And I, I have a few of those as well. How do you propagate Tibuchina? 
Timochina, actually, same way we did any of these. I had Timochina in here. It, it's simple from uh, softwood cuttings. I um, mean, we can do it right now. Softwood okay. cuttings. Timochina cutting here. I'm going to remove some of the, the lower leaves. I'll make a fresh cut. Dip it in rooting hormone. Voila. And stick. Or, or even in. no rooting hormone. Yeah, I, it probably will root. Yeah, it, but it's super easy. Will peppers like Chinese five color and lemon drops continue to work as house plants, or should I take cuttings the second year? I would probably, I mean, I you could try keeping them. It's probably easier to collect the peppers and collect seeds and regrow them from seed. If it comes true. If it comes true. I mean, as long as it's not an F1 hybrid pepper, some, I think it'd be fine. Do, but a lot of those, those ornamental ones, I think are inbred. Uh, some, of the, some of the ornamental ones, you can just let the seeds fall down yeah. and throw back in the pot. The uh, but year. you could take softwood cuttings as well if you really wanted to. They're going to be hard to keep through the winter because they're going to get spider mites. I'll say that one sounds like one that's going to get spider mites. <laughs> that's why I said just save the seed, sow the seed in May, April. And Sp then spider mites outdoors are usually knocked back by the rains, and you keep a. a a plant that's usually outside indoors where it's not raining and spider mites can take over very quickly. I like to overwinter a sweet potato that I have that I can't buy anywhere and I just keep it in a, um, a container of water because I can take it out of the container, put the whole plant in the sink and just wash it off and I do that once a week, once every other week just to keep the minor spider mites at bay because they love the sweet potato. Otherwise you have to give your plants a bath. Yeah. <laughs> One more question. How warm do you have to keep the cuttings over the winter? Have lighting, but wondered if garage might be okay. It would depend on what it is. Most of these are subtropicals. If they want to keep them actively growing, uh, you're probably going to have to keep them a little bit warmer. Um, I mean, so I'm, I'm lucky. I have a unheated, insulated garage, and that works out very well. I have a lot of large plants in there. Uh, they're typically not newly propagated ones, they're just the ones that overwinter that have just been in my uh, display in the back porch. But mine's an insulated, unheated garage. So those, if, if they're truly tropicals, for instance, they might not take the temperatures that are in your garage. It could actually outright, just due to chill damage, not freezing, till the temperatures below a certain temperature, say 45 to 50, might be fatal to them. So, so my, my garage gets into the 50s, and I quite often yell, close the door, yeah. close the door, let's get it done quickly. Uh, well, other outside. things might be perfectly fine once they're established, but they're gonna, the, the rate of growth is going to be very slow, and it's going to be slower indoors as it is. So that's kind of like you were, uh, the person who was asking me about, how fast is my Brugmancy going to grow? I Warmer really can't tell you. <laughs> it depends on temperature and lighting, and, yeah. um, and gen there's a lot of factors there. But you can easily overwinter them this way. Last question. Any special instructions for pelagoniums? Pelagoniums. The, the cutting you took? Same thing. Uh, I didn't stick them, but you can stick these just the same. Uh, a lot of your um, geraniums, actually, I would not do a fresh cut. You can let, actually let them dry off on your typical geraniums. Um, and, and, and you can use rooting hormone. You don't have to necessarily if it's a real well-drained media. But same idea. You can um, do cuttings the same way. This is a really, just a simple, this is the, 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 the basic, uh, most of this stuff is just rather basic on how to do this. this is, none of these are complicated. Well, that looks like that takes care of all the questions. So thank you, Tim, for coming out today and talking mm -hmm. to us about uh, propagating tender plant or tender perennials so we can overwinter them from next year and also thanks to Carol and Alexander yes. for being here as part of the film crew today we're very glad we have such great volunteers they took good care of everyone while I was away on vacation so thank you very much for helping out while I was away um, we hope you join us for next week we of course are having our Q&A session it's the horticulture hour and we'll be here to answer mm -hmm. any and all of your horticulture questions that time um, no topics uh, uh, are planned, so bring any of your questions to us. We'll see you then. Have a great week. Enjoy the rain. <laughs>